Hello everyone! Today I'd like to show you how to use the Elements Viewer in the Source Filmmaker. It's an incredibly powerful tool which allows you to change many different properties of your movie sessions. But while it can do incredibly much, you should probably mess around with it on another session, or only use it on your bigger projects if you really know what you're doing. Before we can get started though, there's a lot of information that you need to know before you can even start using the Element Viewer that I'll get through first. First off, we have to talk a bit about how sessions are exactly set up in Source Filmmaker. Because in SFM, you don't simply have one world where you have everything contained. It's actually split into two. We'll call those the movie world and the game world. When you load a map, you'll already see that there's some models and lights all around the place. Those are part of the game world, since you have those showing up even when you were to launch the game and launch the map in there. You may also notice that there's some objects missing at times. You can add those using the viewport's right-click menu, clicking on Draw Game Entities, and then checking Other Entities. Now the map looks a bit more complete. Objects that then appear include pickups, control points, doors, anything that's dynamic, basically. They're still part of the game world, but you can get them into the movie world with the record feature that SFM provides. Of course, any animation set you add to your shot will also be part of the movie world. All of this is important because you'll only be able to change the properties of everything that is part of your movie world. The game world can only be manipulated in a very limited way. Next up, I'll need to talk about the different data types that you'll encounter when working with the element viewer. This is important because you'll often be deciding about which data type to actually work with, and if you don't know what an integer or a string is, it can get pretty confusing pretty quickly. If you already know a bit about programming, you're free to skip this section. I'll not be going over all data types that SFM has to offer, simply because you don't always need all of them. So here's the most important ones in a quick overview. An integer, abbreviated as int, represents a whole number. In SFM, you only have access to a signed 32-bit integer, which basically means every number between around minus 2 billion and 2 billion. A float, or floating point number, is used to store any decimal number. It's one of the most commonly used data types in Source Filmmaker, and it can have way larger positive and negative numbers stored inside of it. The downside of them is that they get incredibly inaccurate, which leads to large numbers or numbers with different fractional digits not ending up the same way you wrote them. A boolean, in short bool, is the simplest data type. It only has an enabled or a disabled state. In SFM, they're represented by a simple checkbox. A string can store any amount of characters as a text. They're most commonly used for file path or for names. An array is a data type that allows you to store multiple objects of the same type, such as an array of strings or integers. Each data type has an array version of itself, inside of SFM. The last data type that you need to know about that isn't specific to SFM is a vector. It is used to store multiple floats. You'll only get the choice between a vector 2, vector 3 or a vector 4. They all contain 2, 3 and 4 decimal numbers respectively. They're very similar to arrays, but they're only used in cases where the amount of values is known to always be the same, such as with position or rotation of an animation set. There's a few other data types that are specific to SFM, but these are the most important ones. In SFM, colors are actually a separate data type. You don't have to use the color data type when working with them, but it provides you with a very simple color picker that's easy to use. The most important data type of them all, though, is the element. Elements work the same way as an object would in other programming languages. They can be any generic thing with certain attributes. A simple example would be an animal element. It would have attributes such as name, skin color, and so on. Elements can also inherit from each other. This means that elements can stem from others, sharing the attributes of the parent. In the example of our element animal, you could have the element bird inherit from animal. It would still have the attributes of animal, but also new ones, such as the shape or color of its beak, for example. You could go deeper through the hierarchy as well, for example by having the different kinds of birds as separate elements as well. So now finally, with all this background information, we can talk about the element viewer. It allows you to edit your session file in the rawest state possible. Whatever changes you do to the session get reflected in the element viewer. 
If you were to convert and open a DMX file, which is the format in which your sessions get saved in, using Notepad for example, you'd see the same thing as you would in the Elements Viewer, since that's all that SFM internally needs to show and edit your movie. When you first switch to the Element Viewer, you'll see a tree view that's split in half. The left half shows a tree structure, which contains all elements and attributes. We will get to the different text colors inside of it later on. You can think of it like with folders on your desktop, where you have different files, which are in this case attributes, and folders, which would be elements and arrays. The right column, labeled as data, shows the values of set elements and attributes. In the case of attributes, you can click on a button or text field to change their value. You can enable additional columns using the gear menu on the top right of your element viewer. While the unique ID column only has limited use, you can use the type column to see the data type of each attribute. The type of an element, however, is shown in the data column. The four buttons at the top left are used to navigate the element viewer. The home button resets the tree view to its default, with the session elements being up top and all child elements collapsed. You can change which element is the root element, so which one is the topmost, by right-clicking an element and pressing Make Root. Note that this does not work for arrays. Using the Up button, you can then change the root to the parent of the current root, or forward and back to navigate back and forth. When right-clicking on an element or attribute, the contents completely depend on what you're right-clicking on. Everything has regular copy, cut and paste actions. You also get a new paste special option, but we'll get to how that works in another video. You can add new attributes to an element, where you'll need to specify the data type which you need to add. Or you can rename or remove existing attributes. Similarly, you can press add item on an array to add a new entry to it. When right-clicking an element, you can use set element to change its type. Inside, you'll see a huge drop-down containing all element types in SFM. The topmost is DM element, which stands for Data Model Element. It's the most basic type of element, only having a name attribute by default. You can, however, add any number of attributes yourself. All entries below are inheriting from DM element, whereas any sub-menus indicate elements that have children, such as with DME clip containing DME film clip or DME FX clip. Note that the list inside of set element may be limited depending on what type the attribute accepts. The color of attributes shows you which attributes are part of the element you're working with. All entries in grey text are part of the element by default, while yellow entries are custom added ones. The root element and all elements inside of arrays are marked as green. You can also import and export elements to save and load them for use as a template or the like. A quick way to find the element of something in your session is through right-clicking it and going to Show an Element Viewer. This works for animation sets in the animation set editor, shots, tracks, track groups, sound clips and effect clips. In some cases, such as with animation sets, you'll get multiple choices, since they have multiple elements saving information about them. There's also some smaller information about the Element Viewer that might be useful to know. For example, the fact that changes made in the element viewer are not affected by time. This means that a change of an animation set's attribute will stick for the duration of the shot. So if you were to change the skin of a model, for example, from inside the element viewer, your model will keep that skin for the entire shot. This also means that you can change attributes and the like while inside the clip editor, unlike with sliders in the animation set editor, where you need to be in the graph or motion editor to see any changes. In order to animate the values of an attribute, however, you'll need quite a lot of setup. I'll be releasing a tutorial for this at a later point. You should also be aware of a bug where changing the value of an attribute does not seem to do anything. This can be fixed by pressing the back button and going back to what we are doing. You'll see the value return to what it was before it stopped working. So now that you know a bunch about how to work with the element viewer and how it all works internally, you're probably wondering, what the hell can I actually do with it? 
other than what you can already do inside of SFM without it, I'm going to show you three different cases where using the Element Viewer can give you some additional options. Number 1. Effect Clips You can overlay a few effects onto your shot by using the Overlay Track group, but did you know that they actually have a lot of properties that you can change? By using the Show in Element Viewer option, we can see a lot of customizability offered by the different effect clips. This way, we can also overlay images onto the screen, such as film grain or vignette. If we went ahead and created a color correction file, we could also apply it. Number 2. Uber Lights All lights in SFM have a setting hidden inside of the element viewer that allows you to customize them way more than otherwise possible. The checkbox Uber Light in the Lights element allows you to change a few more sliders in the animation set. The most useful ones are Width and Height, which allow you to change the size of the cone. This is very useful for lights with a gobo texture for more precise control, but also in general to avoid certain parts of a model to be lit. Edge Width and Height are for more precise control around the borders. Cut on and cut off make the lights start and stop after a certain distance, without fading slowly like it would with the Far Z attenuation and Min Max distances. And finally, Near Edge and Far Edge seem to control the fade of cut on and cut off. But the most important of them all is number 3, Overhead Materials. They're incredibly useful since they allow you to change the materials of each model separately. So let's try this. Let's create a model, in my case I'm going to create a heavy, and right click its animation set. Hit the Add Override Materials option. If you then go Show an Element Viewer and view the model's element, you can see an array labeled Materials appear on the bottom. It should already have elements inside of it that are named after the different materials. Expanding those elements shows a path to the VMT file in the MTL name attribute. In case you don't know, a VMT file contains information about how the texture of that material should be displayed, adding effects such as reflection, refraction, glow, and so on. In order to find those files, go to your SFM directory, go to Game, then enter the mods folder of which your model comes from. In my case it's a TF2 model, so I'll enter the TF folder. Then go to Materials, and follow the rest through with your MTL name path. If you open the VMT file in Notepad, you'll then see the definition of the material. Using override materials, you could now edit any parameter you want, or add your own. The easiest way to know what each does, and what data type you'll need to use, is through the Valve Developer Community. Simply search the name of the parameter on there, and you should find a detailed article about it. For example, dollar $Base Texture defines the texture that the material should use. So by adding a new attribute of the type string and the name of the shader parameter dollar $Base Texture and entering the path of another texture file, we can change how our heavy looks like. We could also increase the shine of his skin using dollar $Fong Boost and dollar $Fong Exponent, which are both floats. Do note, however, that in most cases you can't add a new parameter. It doesn't work always, it's very inconsistent, but for example with dollar self alone one which would make the heavy's face glow in the dark, doesn't really change anything in this case. However, by adding it to the VMT file and reloading it, it works just fine. The Valve Developer Community also includes a list of shader parameters, in case you're interested in what else you can do with materials. So to summarize, the element viewer of the Source Filmmaker allows you to change the data of your session in order to access properties and features that would otherwise be unaccessible or impossible. However, you can do way more than what was shown in this video, even with override materials alone, the possibilities are basically endless. Be sure to tell your friends if you found this helpful, and I hope I'll see you another time.